Well, welcome everybody, wherever you're watching from. I cannot believe we get to talk about God's word again together. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, we are in the middle of a series called Honed. And if you're just joining us, I encourage you to go back and watch the previous messages. But I wanna get us kind of thinking in, uh, really clearly on a heart focus in our message today. So I wanna start with a question. The question is this, are you hungry? Are you hungry? Did you come today hungry for God's word? Did you come starving to hear something great or profound or, or something that would inspire you or comfort you or bring you to a place of confession? And I'm gonna ask it in a different way. Did you come hungry because perhaps to this week you fasted from God's word? That you fasted from relationship with him and with others? Is that why you're hungry? If you haven't figured it out yet, the topic of the day is fasting. And, and I'm afraid that sometimes we spiritually fast and we come ready to be filled as if it's a buffet and we're gonna get everything we need from one message in 30 minutes on a Sunday. So are you hungry? It's not meant to be a condemning statement. Maybe it's a little convicting. Maybe you're going, yeah, I guess I have. But I want to challenge our heart of fasting. But before we start, I really need to lay a groundwork because I can hear and have heard some conversation going on. And so I want to start here. I want to start with Jesus and lay a very clear foundation for today's topic and really the heart of this sermon series called Honed. And the first is this thing that Jesus said on the cross. He says this, when his arms are outstretched and he's pinned to the, the cross and his final words are, it is finished. See, he looks down at the Jewish system that was put in place to direct everything to him. And he says, it's done. No more sacrifices are needed. I am the perfect sacrifice. There's no more circumcision requirements. There's no more legalistic approaches and law placed on you. All of those were geared to point you to this moment where I would proclaim and declare it is finished. And some of you need to hear that because you've been working really hard for Jesus. But it's finished. The second thing I want you to hear is from Galatians 5, where it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That some in the course of this series, I know, I know your heart, you've heard things like, I'm not good enough. I'm, I've been told now I have to read more. I have to pray more. I have to give more. I have to fast. Because your mindset perhaps has been in a doer mentality, a works-driven approach to Jesus where you hope that you can do exactly enough to please Jesus. And I want to tell you, it's finished. You're free from that. I want you to just in your mind say, hallelujah, thank you, God. I am free today that you love me and you're pleased with me because of my faith in you, period. End of work. And in you, I find rest. That was our sermon last, last week is I find rest in Jesus from all of that work. And maybe you're going then, what is the deal with spiritual disciplines? It sounds like work. My hope is you'll find rest and begin to see that spiritual disciplines are the heartbeat of walking with Jesus. I was in, in Sutherland leading worship and I know some of you heard this. It's breathing. The spiritual life is what spiritual disciplines are. They're just a natural flow of being in relationship with our creator. I had a kind of a picture. I was thinking about, I've been doing some digging and, and I, in our dirt around our house because I had some drainage issues. And, and I had uh, the unfortunate experience again of getting poison oak. And if you don't have poison oak, wherever you're watching from, let me just tell you, it's a horrible thing. It is absolute proof. The fall of man created thorns and terrible plants. And my eyes were swollen and I just hate the stuff. I react terribly to it. But I was thinking about digging. And what would it be like is if I'm out there digging and one of my sons shows up and he grabs a shovel and he says, I just want to dig with you, dad. Man, that'd be cool. Like, 
Uh, no guilt trip on you, by the way, boys. <laughs> but, but for them to just dig and, and, and be in relationship with me. And we can talk. We might throw dirt on each other and just have fun. But, but how quickly perhaps it could turn into this. A big shovel throw. And my son looks at me and goes, Dad, are you pleased with how hard I'm working? And immediately it went from relationship into doing something to try to earn a favor with me. Or I go to sit down and, and Ethan digs more. My son digs more, digs harder perhaps. Says, Dad, are you pleased now? Look how much I've moved. And I said, I was pleased the moment you, I, you showed up. I was just grateful to be with you. I think that's often how spiritual disciplines start. We go in with the right heart, with the desire to be in relationship with our father and then we begin to add to them with the hope that we'll please God with our reading of scripture, with our solitude, with our Sabbath, and today with, with our fasting, with this wrong motivation. And I want to lay that down and just say that Jesus said it's finished. One, you do not have to work anymore. I'm pleased with you because of your faith. And two, I died so you would find freedom. And today you are free from the burden of all of the regulations that we often impose on ourselves. So breathe. Pastor Jay said it this way. Jesus didn't die on the cross to give you a to-do list. He died to be in relationship with you. Whew. Breathe. Let that sink in before we dive into the message today because you've got to get a good hold on what spiritual disciplines are. They're the relationship breathing in and out with our Father for a purpose. And I'm going to dive into that today. So I'm going to start with the question, why should I fast? Why should I fast? And I've, I've added this, this idea of Holy Spirit fasting, this idea that with the Holy Spirit, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, I am going to look at fasting. And I'm going to talk specifically to the, to the biblical idea of a restriction of food and water, food or water, whatever. This idea of restricting nutrients that we take in daily, that's where we're gonna look at. There's lots of other ideas out there that are absolutely fine with perhaps restricting certain types of activities, influences, all kinds of things. I'm talking specific to food today. So why should I? And I wanted to go quickly. I'm not going to be able to go through all of the dialogue and the context of the examples today as we're going to walk through just a lot of biblical examples of why people have fasted. So I've got them in your notes. You can look at those later, perhaps in the week and go in and get a bigger picture. But I just want you to see what were some of the reasons? Why do we see fasting occurring in the life of a follower of Jesus, in the life of the Old Testament Israelites, what was going on? So here's the first one of why should I fast? First is that Jesus demonstrates it. So we model what we do as followers of Jesus by what he did. It's like follow the leader. Look what the leader does. What does the leader do? Well, look at this. Uh, this is this story, this amazing moment where Jesus is, first of all, it says, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. He'd been baptized, right? And was led by the Spirit to the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Man, can you imagine 40 days? That is a long stretch. No food. Ah, oh, 40 days and he was hungry. I want to point it out one. This was a full of the Holy Spirit, a spirit leading into a moment of fasting. And for his purpose, he was getting ready to go and begin to fulfill the final pieces of the puzzle of his ministry on earth before he would be crucified. And isn't it interesting, if you read the rest of this story, the first temptation the devil presents is food. He says, look around at the stones, turn them to bread, eat. And Jesus, he uses scripture to reply, I love this. He says, man does not eat by bread alone, but by the word of God. He says, no, my greatest nourishment comes from God and through his word. 
So Jesus demonstrates fasting and there was a purpose to it and the Holy Spirit was integral in this journey. The second one, I would say it's worship for God. It's just to worship him. And there's this cool thing in Luke 2. The context of the story is that Mary and Joseph, they're about to go and dedicate Jesus at the temple. And there's, there's a lot going on, but there's this prophetess Anna and she is there and it says that she never left the temple, but worshiped day and night, fasting and praying. And then there's this moment where she goes and she approaches uh, Mary and Joseph and says that your son is the one. So she declares this, this prophesying over that Jesus is the promised redeemer. But in that heart, she's worshiping God. And it says that fasting and prayer was part of that worship. Clearly the spirit was active. She was there at the time. She was ready to declare and pronounce over Jesus. There's, this is true. You're the one. And for, I'm sure, the benefit of Mary and Joseph as well, to be declared, you're right. Okay, we're on the right path here. We're not losing our minds. This is Jesus. So worshiping for God is, is the heart of this. It's a way of worship through fasting. Next we have is hearing from God. And it says this, that um, in Acts, this is while they were worshiping the Lord, again, we see worship and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the works to which I have called them. Here's this moment where, where leaders and elders and the body is together and they're worshiping through fasting and they're worshiping and they're praying and it opens their ears to hear the Spirit direct them to Barnabas and Saul. Saul, of course, becomes the Apostle Paul. Saul was the, the executor of Christians who was converted immediately by this Jesus confrontation. And now he's set on course to take the gospel into the Gentiles. And it says that, that they were, I believe, able to hear the Spirit speak because in the midst of their fasting, their ears were just more attuned perhaps to what the Spirit was about to say. Another area we see it is returning to God. And in Joel, it's just a great, great time of the Israelites and the people of, of Israel being called again to return to God. And it says, even now declares the Lord. So God is speaking. He says, even now return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. In other words, humble yourself and return to me. So fasting is a way perhaps of returning. And I do hear people that oftentimes they're followers of Jesus, but they've just drifted. And they'll come in and say, I want to, can I get baptized again? And, and, I, and my response is, uh, no. <laughs> it's, baptism was this moment where you declared Jesus. But perhaps fasting is a moment where you can dedicate time again to return to God and help restore the relationship that, that you've been working on severing, perhaps, that you've drifted away from. It also reminds me of the story, if you, if you don't know it, go look at Jonah this week. Jonah, this guy who's called by God to go to these horrible people, the Ninevites. And of course, Jonah, the, the heartbeat of the story is God calls him and he says no. So he goes the opposite way and God finds a unique way of using a fish to get him barfed back up on the shores <laughs> and to engage the people of Nineveh. And those people's response in that, in that culture was to say, oh no. God has sent somebody to us and let's return to him by fasting. And there's a decree over the land. It's a great story. But again, fasting was the way of focusing my attention to return to this relationship, to this opportunity to be with God. Another way to look at it as well is committing to God. And this is another uh, time when we do this as a, an, elder, an elder board as well as church leaders, as well as, you know, um, life groups or mission teams that we will often fast for this purpose here. It says, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed him to the Lord in whom they had believed. And there was this moment of confirmation of commitment. Yes, God, these people are being called into this ministry. We're fasting, seeking that guidance of commitment to help us in committing. 
I remember, uh, man, there's a time in Cambodia, we, just, we declared sort of a fast. We were about to go visit and we set it up, a day of fasting with the local church and the missionaries. And, and we gathered on this morning and it was a very special time of, of just worshiping and fellowship. We sang songs, we read scriptures. We were praying for people, praying for the move of God. And in the middle of this, we received a phone call of one of the believers who was imprisoned for, there was some kind of shady stuff going on in the government and they were being held now as a result of, uh, I think, just manipulation over him. And so during our fast, during our worship, we prayed fervently for the release of this person. And wouldn't you, I couldn't believe it. In the middle of this, before the end of our set time of fasting, before we gathered uh, as a church body again to break our fast with a meal, this individual was released from prison in a miraculous way that, that can only be explained, I believe, by being in community and relationship with the Father. And he moved. Doesn't always work that way, but it was a moment where it was clear to me, God was actively involved in our worship in our time of fasting. So these are some of the, the things we see in the Bible and all of them are true today and they apply to us. But I wanted to think about, as we move on, I want, I want to talk about the motivation a little bit. You see, we've been talking about spiritual disciplines and I believe God uses spiritual disciplines as tools to soften and shape our hearts that God uses these spiritual disciplines. We've talked about financial giving. We've talked about taking solitude. Last week was finding rest, resting our bodies, resting our busy schedules. We've, we've gone through uh, prayer and talking about the importance of prayer and the value of prayer and the value of reading God's word. And we're talking about fasting. All of these disciplines are designed really to be in an active relationship with our creator for this purpose, so that he would work on our hearts. I think the picture is like this. It's, it's as if I, I took my heart out of my chest and I said, here you go, God, and I place it on the anvil. We've used that imagery. And the master craftsman, our Lord and Savior says, ah, oh. and he goes to that fine work of shaping and polishing and chipping away the rough edges of our heart, tilling the soil of our heart, shaping and molding to the, the, the place that he's calling us to be. And so if we go into spiritual disciplines with that idea of taking my heart and saying, here God, shape me, then I think we find great benefit. But the danger is what I was referring to earlier. The danger is that instead, I go into spiritual disciplines with the wrong motivation. And I grab the hammer and I say, here God, pink, pink, let me show you, pink. I'll show you how good I am, pink. I'll show you how I can shape my heart. And I work and I work and I work. And the whole time I think my father's going, I'm already pleased. I just wanted to be with you and, and work with you. Can I have the hammer back? <laughs> Could I perhaps have an opportunity to work on your heart? So I just want to lay this so clear that that's what these spiritual disciplines are about, is laying the opportunity to say, God, I want to read your word, shape my heart. God, I'm coming to you in prayer, work on me while I invest with you. And this week, God, I, I'm going to deprive my body of food and I'm going to ask you to be a part of this with me. And so the second question is the same as the first, but it's a different emphasis. Not why should I fast, but why should I? Ask yourself that question. What benefit is it to me? Why should I fast? What's the purpose behind it? I've already said it's to soften the heart. I should seek spiritual disciplines and fasting as the one of today for that purpose, to soften my heart, to go in with the right attitude and the right desire. God, soften my heart. But there's a second one that I think is important of why should I fast? It's this, 
to hunger for God. Look at what Jesus says. This is the, the context of this passage is that Jesus and his disciples are out and there's healings happening. Jesus has already been criticized for not um, resting on the Sabbath. But now they're being, he's being criticized. He says, why don't your disciples fast? You see, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, oftentimes they would boast about their fasting. That was a big deal. Look at me. Jesus says this, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. In other words, I am the bridegroom. I am here with them now. There's no reason to fast. They are filled in my presence. They're filled with me, but that day is coming when I am going to ascend into heaven and they will fast as a sign of hunger and reminder that I am all they need. So why should I fast? To help realign my hunger. I started by asking you if you were hungry. And I gotta tell you, fasting is one of those areas where it clearly helps block out distraction. <laughs> All right, I don't know about you, but have you ever taken on the challenge of even restricting certain foods? We call them diets. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but every time that I decide, decide, it's time, Craig, you got to lose some weight. You have been pigging out. And so I set my mind to it. I get myself ready. Man, I'm ready. Okay, God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to have bread. I'm not going to have rice. I'm working on that right now. I'm not going to eat sugar. I'm not going to do these things. I'm going to kind of strict myself to vegetables and fruits and wholesome food. I'm going to do this. And inevitably, day one, I walk in and there's a wall of odor of fresh donuts. Every time I feel like I come in, they haven't seen donuts for weeks, but all of a sudden there they are. And I walk through the thick wall and it's like my nose, I'm just hungry. And I could have had a nice nutritious breakfast, but I gotta tell you, it's a distraction. And I find that food becomes a moment for me of distraction because you know what? I eat my feelings. I don't have to be hungry to eat a donut. <laughs> And oftentimes I find myself when I'm uh, angry that I go to food or I'm upset about something, I go to food or, you know that term comfort food? That's what I'm seeking, like a big stack of pancakes with syrup and butter because honestly, I don't wanna deal with the difficulty of the day. What I wanna go into is a food coma. Oh God, just, just let me disappear in my pancakes. <laughs> See, food has this unique way, I believe, of distracting us from really seeking what's best. And so why should I fast? I think fasting should be a regular practice that becomes a part of us where we then begin to seek God. And what you will find if you do it well is that as your stomach churns and as it groans, done in the right way, we can worship and we can just give thanks to God. Thank you, God, for food. Ah, oh, thank you. And that instead of eating the meal, perhaps I sit and I feast on the spiritual intake of his word. And I get filled again. And then my mind is more open to hear perhaps what God has to say. Think about for a moment, the amount of time you spend dealing with food just in the course of one day. Let's lay that out real quick. So I wake up in the morning and for me, I'm like, what is the first meal? I can't wait, I'm ready to eat. All right, so I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna get the eggs out maybe and I'm gonna get some cheese and maybe a tortilla and I'm gonna turn the stove on. So I get that going, which meant get the dishes out and I go through the process of getting the food out, get it together and we're talking 20 minutes and I'm eating. Then I eat it. Well, for me, I eat it in about four seconds. For some of you, it's a few more minutes added on to that. And then I sit there and just go, oh yeah, thank you. And then lunch comes up and I'm already thinking about lunch because I got to leave the house. What am I going to have this week? I'm thinking about food before I leave the house because am I going to take a lunch or am I going to buy a lunch? Ah, this week I'll be lazy. I'm going to buy a lunch today. Do I have enough money? Got it in my pocket. Good, here I go. So then all day long, I'm going to leave for lunch. What time am I going to leave for lunch? Well, I don't know. I got to finish this meeting. I go get the food. Again, I sit down. I eat it in about four more seconds. And now I'm full and I'm thinking, man, I ate too much. Why did I eat so much? Now I'm miserable and I need a nap because I ate too much. 
But it's not too long after that. And I'm thinking, okay, dinner's coming. All right, what am I gonna do for dinner? And if dinner is a bigger one for you like it is for me, now I'm planning it out. Well, I gotta get this, I gotta buy that. Oh, I better run by the store, I'm out of salad. And just in the course of the day, I could see three hours of my mind occupied on what meals I'm going to eat and then when I'm enjoying them and then my <laughs> gluttonous feeling after going, why did I do that again? I ate so much. Oh. What if that time was directed for a day for God? It's an opportunity to take something that sustains me to the one who ultimately really sustains me. That's the heart behind it. And so I just challenge this, this idea of fasting because I think it's, it's one of those disciplines that can be very easy to fall into some traps with. And so I wanna jump into the next question, which is how should I fast then? So what, is that, what, what does it really mean? I'm talking about restricting food and water. But look at what it says here in Matthew. It says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces and show others their fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. I guess my first advice on how should I fast is that it's done in secret. And although I'm gonna challenge you to perhaps a, a, a church body fast dedication time, that you wake up in the morning and you clean yourself up, that you don't walk around and, and when people ask, oh, why do you look so sad that you say, oh, I'm just fasting for Jesus right now and oh, my stomach hurts. And they go, oh, I'm so sorry that your stomach hurts. And Jesus is saying there is you just received a reward. <laughs> Did it feel good, the pat on the back? And then Jesus is saying, just in secret, just come to me. Be with me. See what I might do in this time. See what I might have to say to you. What would it look like? Second way I would say is this, that we do it with joy and passion to deepen our relationship with Jesus, that that's the heart behind it. It's joy and it's a dedication it's to say, okay, I'm gonna do this on this day for this time frame, And I wanna do it, Jesus, to be with you. Thank you that you're already pleased with me. <laughs> Thank you that it's finished. Thank you that I'm free and I'm not having to do this. Thank you that you give me the opportunity to invest time with you. And I wanna extend a caution for a moment when it comes to fasting. Here's where the temptation comes to feel guilt. First, some of you are in a, a health state where physically fasting from food would not be wise. And so if you've this whole time been wrestling with your head, what do I do? How do I do this? Oh no, God's not gonna be okay if I don't fast. I need you to set that down because I understand and God understands that if your health dictates that fasting from food is not wise because of medication, because perhaps of an eating disorder, because of something that has caused you to be where if you don't eat, it's not healthy for you, then I wanna extend grace and caution to you. And there's some resource uh, in your resources there, a video you could watch if it might help you to wrestle with that. In fact, some of you eating something as unto the Lord may be just as much worship done in the right heart in the right way as fasting from eating something. And the second is, I wanna hold you very carefully here because some of you may take on the challenge of a 24 hour fast. And so I'm challenging you from Sunday evening till Monday evening to take that seriously. And maybe you'll do uh, no food, but some water. That's great. You need to determine what's best right now for your physical need. And some of you might find yourself at one o'clock on Monday, really struggling. And now you're, you're caught up in the guilt of fasting. What if I break this fast? What if I eat something? Oh no, what, what will God think of me? And I'm gonna just say it's finished. 
and you're free. And two, give thanks to God and to eat if that's necessary. But I think you'll be surprised in the process of fasting how many times you go toward food in the course of a day. The snacks, you'll catch yourself, oh, wait a minute. Oh yeah, I was fasting. I think you'll find that in this process, your ears will be open perhaps to some new things that God has been just dying to share with you. But I hope ultimately that that in the course of this fasting, in the course of all the spiritual disciplines we're working through, you'll find yourself saying, I don't have to, but God, I desire these things. I wanna live a life in relationship with you. And I'll close with just one last thought. I was, I was really wrestling with how to bring this into this message, but I, I was just imagining a marriage. And imagine a marriage to, to my wife where we never invested finances in each other. We never invested time alone with each other. We never dined together and had meals together. We never set solitude together to go away and, and block away from the distraction that our whole life was a matter of, we said, I do, and then I never see you again. I think that sounds to me like a not a very healthy relationship. And I think that spiritual disciplines are exactly that. I think they're pictures of having a relationship, a natural breathing in, breathing out, communicating and spending time with. So I hope that as you're kind of walking through all the spiritual disciplines, that today you can find rest. And that if you take on the challenge of taking 24 hours this week and just dedicating it to God, that you would find the right way to do it for your health, for your time frame, to, to best find a way to say, God, I want to do this with you. Holy Spirit, lead me in these things. Thanks for joining me. I'll hand off to the campus pastors and let them take it from here. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, If you're at home online, I hope that you're not home because you're sick. Man, that's been tough. There's been a lot of people ill during this time. And if you're uh, gonna take this challenge of fasting this week, I just encourage you to really go through uh, the scriptures that were presented this week uh, in the message that I gave you. Look at the context of some of of the reasons why people fasted. And maybe for you, this is a chance to perhaps even for the first time hear from God that, that maybe you've been wrestling with, should I, is this really what God, are you calling me to surrender my life to you? This may be the perfect opportunity to take a day and dedicate one of the most important decisions of eternity. That through this process, God might reveal himself to you and you may find yourself now an opportunity to engage with your creator. Uh, as you fast, I just want to remind you of uh, the, the the balancing that you're going to need to do. Make sure that that your fast is appropriate for your stage of life, for the health, wherever you are. Um, Also to make the duration. Sometimes the duration, maybe 24 hours is too much for your first time. Remember, we're talking about flex and muscles. Maybe you're just going to skip a meal. First time going at it, no breakfast. That may be enough for your first encounter as you take on this uh, spiritual discipline of fasting. So let me pray for you. I, I think this is an important message that I hope will carry you into a life of pursuit of God and let him be a part of that pursuit. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for those who are listening. I pray that as they uh, endeavor perhaps to take a time of fasting, God, that you would uh, guide their hearts, that you would set them up in the right position, in the right mental frame, in the right direction so that this time of fasting is meant to bring glory to you and to deepen our relationship with you. Thank you for those that are listening. May you bless them as they go forward. May you give them strength and encourage by your spirit to follow you and, and be actively engaged. In a, in a life with you. And it's in your powerful name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you all next weekend.